Good afternoon, colleagues, um, and welcome to this community of practice on key populations and um, programming. Um, as you know, this is part of the global series of, of meetings and followed by actually newsletters on specific key topics um, relevant to key population programming and the HIV response. As additional colleagues are actually joining, we see the numbers going up. Um, let me just um, read out to you the topic of this session, which is navigating the WHO's 22 consolidated guidelines on HIV viral hepatitis and STI prevention, diagnosis, treatment and care for key populations. So today we'll be focusing on the new um, WHO guidelines, what they mean for programming, what change they can bring, what has actually changed in those guidelines, and what does it mean for countries um, and communities. And we have um, a great set of speakers and panelists who will share actually out the guidelines and then reflections on what they mean and at their level, be it at country level, at the level of communities, at the level of funding partners and other key, key stakeholders. Um, as you can see from, uh, from, from this slide, you can choose your preferred language for interpretation and you can use the Q&A box um, in the Zoom, um, Zoom screen to actually um, make your contributions and ask and ask questions. And um, we'll start this session with the, with the presentation on the actual um, on the actual um, guidelines. Um, you can go to the next um, next slide and, and we'll hear from Anton Mozalewskis from WHO about the key, new key population guidelines, what they what, what they put forward and what has changed compared to previous guidelines. So over to you, Anton to start with this important presentation on the new WHO guidelines. Thank you for introduction, Clemens. Um, and uh, thank you also um, for inviting us to this session. And also thank, thank you uh, all the people who are joining now this session. So I, I, in this brief presentation, I will uh, shortly explain you what is new in our WHO consolidated uh, guidelines for key populations. So, uh, they were just launched uh, in July during the AIDS uh, 2022 uh, conference published online, and we are currently translating to several other languages. So in this presentation, I will um, explain uh, the framework, uh, say a few words about the methodology, uh, how we updated our guidelines, uh, uh, explain what is the recommended package, uh, what are the new and updated recommendations and good policy statements and, uh, and good practice statements, and also what are the next steps. So next slide, please. Um, so um, uh, first of all, uh, we must prioritize key populations in the response to HIV, viral hepatitis and STI, and key populations um, is uh, internationally uh, a recognized term when we refer to the people uh, who are due to some risk factors, uh, some behavior or occupational or, or other factors are at increased risk for uh, HIV infection. And there are five, not only HIV actually, but also viral hepatitis and STI. And in this updated guidelines, for the first time, we uh, integrate uh, the three disease areas in, in one document also showing that it's uh, it's more uh, it's more efficient actually to address HIV uh, together with uh, viral hepatitis and STI. So the five key populations are uh, men who have sex with men, uh, uh, sex workers, um, people who inject drugs, uh, trans and gender diverse people, and also prisoners. And there, may, there are many uh, factors uh, which are coming together, which make them more vulnerable to uh, HIV, hepatitis and STIs. And these are both biological factors, social factors, but also importantly, uh, um, uh, factors uh, like legal factors and social factors, such as uh, criminalization, uh, uh, discrimination and stigma, and also violence and also some factors which are not directly linked, but also often uh, contributing to the vulnerability, such as unemployment 
and poverty. So all those factors, they actually uh, come together to uh, create barriers to assess uh, prevention, testing and treatment services for HIV, hepatitis and STI and, and put them at higher risk. And, and, and also uh, importantly, that the UNAIDS estimates show that in, in almost all regions and globally key populations uh, uh, constitute the biggest burden of HIV infection, but also for hepatitis and STI, that's, that, that's the same. Uh, so next slide, please. So um, uh, recognizing that uh, we uh, know how to, uh, we, we define what needs to be done. So to end HIV, uh, STI and viral hepatitis is a public health threat and end discrimination. We need to uh, uh, prevent, diagnose and treat uh, those infections among key populations. And for this, we need to uh, ensure access to uh, services for key population and uh, scale them up. And for this, we need to uh, reduce the structural barriers. We need to uh, work on community empowerment, uh, Im improve service delivery approaches, uh, and also provide evidence-based uh, uh, people-centered and quality interventions. And of course, we need to think uh, also, how we're going to find, uh, to, how we're going to fund uh, those uh, interventions. Next slide, please. So, uh, shortly about the methodology, um, WHO has a very strict and very well defined uh, process how to develop uh, new guidelines, and what, that's why sometimes it takes so long uh, to update guidelines. So, we were working almost for two years on on this document. So first of all, we um, I consolidated what already exists because uh, there are, uh, apart from the key population guidelines, there are also other uh, recommendations from WHO, which are uh, uh, very relevant for uh, addressing HIV, hepatitis and STI uh, among key populations. So then uh, we were identifying uh, what, where, where are the gaps, which recommendations, uh, which new recommendations are needed and which recommendations uh, should be uh, revised in light of uh, new evidence and updated. So then we conduct uh, evidence review, which includes both literature review, like systematic review, a classical systematic review. Um, and then in this case, we also, uh, the other part was um, preference, um, values and preference study, which was conducted uh, in collaboration with uh, uh, key population networks, and this was also a very uh, important part of the development of the guidelines. And then uh, using the uh, guideline development group, uh, the, the, the recommendations were developed uh, based on the, on the great methodology, uh, and, uh, and so we, we developed new and updated recommendation and also develop prioritized packages. Next slide, please. Um, this is just a, a, a summary. We will hear more about uh, uh, this the, this um, qualitative research, which was focused on uh, uh, defining the values and preferences from the key populations. So it was conducted in collaborations with all the global uh, key population networks and covered all regions, all countries, and all the all, almost all key population except uh, except prisoners, because there there is no uh, global uh, community networks uh, for, for prisoners. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, so in this uh, updated version of the guidelines, uh, we uh, one of the new innovations in, in the document that we have developed um, kind of um, uh, packages of different interventions, uh, group them in, in, in different uh, uh, groups and group in, in different packages. So first, and uh, most important are the enabling interventions, uh, which are essential for impact. So, so these are these are not new. Uh, these are recommendations to address uh, structural barriers to health services access for key populations. Then uh, we uh, def uh, we classified health interventions into three groups. One are uh, essential. Uh, interventions for impact, which are uh, necessary, which have uh, demonstrated direct impact on HIV, hepatitis, and STI incidence and prevalence. So these are kind of the essential interventions for impact. Then there are also essential interventions for broader health, which um, not necessarily directly have an impact on the incidence 
uh, and prevalence of HIV, hepatitis, and STI, but they are uh, uh, extremely important for key population uh, to ensure a person-centered appro -centered approach and universal, universal health coverage. So very often those interventions are not uh, provided by uh, HIV programs, but they are part of the health system and they have to be uh, also uh, provided in an integrated person-centered way. And finally, there are also supportive interventions which can also um, uh, help uh, increase access to health services for key population. Next slide. Uh, so essential interventions, so essential interventions for uh, uh, addressing the structural barriers, so-called enabling interventions, they, they were also uh, already defined in the previous uh, version of the guidelines, but with the time we're getting more and more evidence uh, how impactful they are in addressing the epidemics. And these are like four main groups. One is remo removing punitive laws, policies, and practices. Uh, the second group are uh, reducing stigma and discrimination, so interventions that addressing stigma. Uh, another set of interventions uh, are, uh, is uh, um, aiming for community empowerment. And finally, a set of interventions addressing uh, violence. So uh, in the document, you will see there are many more uh, interventions among, uh, uh, under this each of those groups. Next slide, please. Uh, so as uh, the health uh, sector, uh, for us also important, the health uh, interventions and uh, um, those which are essential for impact, those which are uh, necessary for uh, reducing the incidence and prevalence, so they can be grouped into prevention, diagnosis, and treatment. And prevention is a, uh, is the um, a combination prevention package uh, that includes harm reduction, uh, condom services, uh, pre and post exposure, prevention of uh, vertical transmission of HIV, syphilis, and hepatitis B, uh, hepatitis B vaccination, and also addressing. Uh, chemsex. So uh, some of those interventions are um, uh, will help to uh, reduce incidence and prevalence of uh, several uh, uh, infections, such as harm reduction, for example. And the diagnosis and treatment, these are all uh, known uh, interventions. Next slide, please. Uh, the next group are, uh, as I already mentioned, these are health interventions, which are essential for broader health. And these are uh, uh, also coming from the values uh, pre and preferences study. These are also very important for the key populations. And they include uh, uh, mental health services, prevention and treatment of uh, NCDs, including uh, uh, cervical cancer, reproductive services, including say, access to safe abortion uh, and, uh, and uh, addressing alcohol and substance use, and also gen gender affirming care, which is extremely important for uh, transgender and gender diverse people. Next slide. So uh, we also have a separate uh, uh, chapter on young key populations, uh, uh, defining some certain services or some certain areas uh, which have to be uh, addressed when developing uh, programs for young key populations. Next slide. So uh, now I will uh, turn into um, uh, describing briefly the new interventions or new recommendations or good policy, uh, good practice statements. So first of all, uh, the, um, we have reviewed the evidence for so-called behavioral interventions and, uh, and the new uh, good policy statement uh, says that um, behavioral interventions that aim to change behaviors to reduce risk associated with these infections uh, have not been shown to have an effect on HIV, hepatitis, and STI incidents, nor on risk behavior such as uh, condom use and needle, and needle uh, sharing. This is a very uh, important uh, um, uh, thing because uh, we know that uh, many programs are uh, dedicating a lot of uh, funding to, to those interventions. And this is also important to, um, to specify that we are talking specifically about behavioral interventions that aim to change behaviors, so for example, to, uh, to reduce uh, uh, unsafe sex or to reduce needle sharing. Of course, we need to remember that there is also a lot of other 
uh, uh, behavioral interventions, counseling and information sharing, which is not aiming at changing behavior, which can be key for uh, engagement uh, with key populations and also is very important uh, uh, for, um, for uh, improving health uh, of the key populations in general. But uh, speaking about the interventions that aim to change behavior, they're not uh, been shown to, to have an effect on, on the incidence of infections. New, next slide, please. Um, uh, we have a new good practice uh, statement on uh, chemsex and with chemsex for, for the purpose of these guidelines, uh, we understand uh, uh, when individuals engage in sexual activities uh, while taking primarily stimulant drugs and the, this also this practice typically uh, involve multiple participants and over, over a prolonged period of time. So um, uh, because the, this, this is quite a, a challenging definitions in different countries, there are uh, different definitions of, of chemsex. Sometimes they are referring only to MSM and transgender people. Sometimes they are uh, used in a broader sense. So uh, we couldn't find uh, specifically, uh, specifically interventions that can uh, uh, reduce uh, uh, incidence or prevalence of, of uh, chemsex or related risk, but it was clear that integrated uh, uh, services that integrate sexual and reproductive health, mental health, and also access to uh, sterile uh, needles and syringes and OMT services uh, is, uh, um, is required for comprehensive uh, uh, response to chemsex. Uh, next slide, please. Um, there is a new rec uh, there are two new recommendations uh, specific for hepatitis C. Uh, so first one is uh, related to uh, people who uh, at ongoing risk and history of treatment induced or spontaneous clearance of HCV infection uh, should be or may be offered. Uh, repeated testing uh, for the presence of HCV viremia. So to to say it in more uh, in, in more simple words, uh, this is a recommendation for uh, testing for reinfection of hepatitis C for people uh, who are at risk. And those are mostly people who inject drugs and uh, sometimes uh, men who have sex with men. So for those people, even after clearance of HCV infection, if there is ongoing risk, they should be offered uh, testing for uh, HCV viremia uh, directly without testing for uh, anti-HCV antibodies because as we know they, they can stay uh, uh, positive even after cure. Uh, next slide and the second pre uh, recommendation is related to uh, uh, treatment of uh, HCV infection uh, which should be offered uh, without delay to people with recently acquired HCV infection and ongoing risk. So basically uh, this can be understood as a recommendation for treatment of uh, acute or recent HCV infection uh, without waiting six months until we see whether the infection becomes chronic or not. Uh, because, uh, first of all, the access to uh, direct acting antiviral has uh, uh, increased dramatically uh, uh, worldwide. And second, um, we shouldn't wait uh, uh, for several months because uh, treatment uh, of HCV uh, can also uh, can be uh, considered also prevention because um, we can prevent uh, uh, onwards transmission of HCV infection if we treat as soon as possible. And also, uh, and also, this is this improves the outcome, uh, the health outcomes uh, of uh, of people who are at risk of HCV infection. Next slide. Um, um, there is a section on service delivery, and uh, there are several new areas specifically uh, which became more relevant after COVID nineteen, uh, such as uh, self testing, uh, virtual interventions. Uh, decentralization and community-led services which improve access, accessibility, availability uh, of services. And there are several, um, several new um, interventions that were proven to be effective during COVID, but uh, we, should, uh, we, should not, um, we should not forget them also after the COVID. The next slide. So one of, uh, um, one of uh, those um, 
uh, interventions is so-called peer navigation. And uh, there was uh, strong enough evidence to uh, develop uh, our recommendations, like proper recommendations. And uh, uh, now we know that peer navigators are recommended to support people from key populations to start uh, uh, treatment of HIV and hepatitis and STI and to remain uh, in care. So, and also it's important to know, uh, remember that peer navigator role is to assi assist uh, members of key populations and they should be uh, treated as, um, as, e uh, as uh, uh, equal um, uh, providers and they have uh, rec uh, ha they should have adequate remunerations, recognition and training. Uh, peer navigators also were uh, often highly valued by their peers. Next slide. So I think it could be the, the last uh, slide. So we have a new, another new recommendation uh, re uh, re related to the uh, uh, online interventions. So we looked mostly into three types of uh, online interventions. So it's online outreach, uh, 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 provide provision of information uh, through online platforms and also online case management. And there was uh, 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 sufficient evidence to recommend online delivery of HIV, hepatitis and STI services to key populations to be offered as an additional options, uh, additional option uh, while ensuring that data security and confidentiality is protected. And next slide. So, uh, and what's next? Uh, next, uh, uh, as I already mentioned, um, the guidelines now are published. We are developing a number of uh, policy briefs, which will be uh, easier to use. We are also translating the guidelines to Russian, Spanish, uh, Portuguese, and uh, in the future also French languages. And uh, there will be uh, further dissemination uh, um, activities uh, this year and next years. And we're also thinking of um, developing um, a framework for community-led monitoring of implementation of of the of these guidelines. And we will be we will we will be looking further for uh, for for those for those activities. Next slide. So yeah, and in the end, I would like to thank uh, all the colleagues, uh, including uh, Virginia uh, McDonald, Annette Verster, uh, Nicholas Luhmann, Rachel Bagley, uh, Meve Di Mello, uh, and others, uh, and also key population networks, which were equal and uh, very important partner in the development of this document, the guideline development group and the external review group. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Anton. So, um, a wonderful presentation on a, on a huge piece of work bringing together, as you have seen, a lot of evidence on, on effectiveness of interventions and a lot of consultation um, as part of the process, a rigorous process, really gives us or puts us in this privileged position now to have an up-to-date guidelines on, on key population programs as part of the HIV um, hepatitis and, and STI responses. Now, we have a, 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 another presentation in relation to, to the guidelines process, um, and that presentation is on the research and involvement of key population network, and it will be presented by Anna Shapiro, who is a policy officer at the Network of Sex Worker Projects. So I'll hand over to you, Anna, for the next presentation. Thank you so much. So thanks for the introduction. Um, I was one of the principal investigators of the uh, values and preferences study that went into the development of the new guidelines, and it was conducted um, in concert with other key population networks, GATE, INPUT, and MPACT, together with WHO. Next slide, please. So today I'm just going to briefly present some of the key findings from our study. I'll start with the rationale and objectives followed by the methods. Then we'll look a little bit at the participant demographics, and then I'll present a few key findings per topic. Next, please. So since key populations are the intended beneficiaries of this guidance, it was absolutely essential that um, any recommendations WHO puts forth were informed by the values, preferences, and lived experiences of key populations. 
So our study therefore sought to provide greater insight into the values and preferences of four, four different key population groups in regards to HIV, STI, and hepatitis services. At the same time, we also looked at identifying key populations health priorities, as well as some of the ongoing structural barriers, which affect values and preferences, as well as access to services. And lastly, we looked at enabling interventions that are recommended by the communities in order to address some of these challenges. Next, please. So as for the methodology, um, participants were recruited using a generic purpose of sampling method across regions. Um, data was collected by regionally based community expert consultants and some of the principal investigators. What that entailed was conducting mostly um, semi-structured interviews and focus groups that were on Zoom, WhatsApp, Skype. And once we had that data collected, the networks collated their respective data, thematically coded it, and then we analyzed it using a shared coding framework, which we developed together. And through that framework, we were able to identify commonalities across the population groups, as well as any population-specific findings or outliers. Next, please. So at a glance, um, as already mentioned, we conducted 61 semi-structured interviews, 32 focus group discussions. There were 229 participants in 69 different countries across all of the networks. Next, please. As for the demographics, um, as you can see, we tried to achieve the best possible regional distribution. Some regions obviously have less participants than others, but it's important to remember that these regions are in and of themselves quite diverse. You can also see the breakdown of participants uh, in high income countries versus low and middle income countries. And then at the bottom, you can see that we had a very diverse range of different gender identities represented in the study. So there's cisgender female, cis male, trans, which includes trans feminine, trans masculine, and trans non binary people. There were other non binary people and other gender non conforming people. Next, please. So now on to the results. Next. So first I wanna uh, look a little bit at some of the overarching health priorities of key populations. Many of these are interconnected. Um, one of the most common priorities cited by participants across the different networks was actually mental health. And although mental health does fall outside of the traditional package for HIV, STI and hepatitis interventions, it plays a major role in shaping people's access to these services as well as on their vulnerability in general. Not to mention mental health issues have been exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as ongoing structural barriers, which were in and of themselves listed as health priorities by many participants. Other health priorities listed included sexual and reproductive health, gender affirming care, harm reduction, and HIV, STI, hepatitis prevention, testing, and treatment. Next, please. Then we looked at perceptions of behavioral interventions and their impacts. What we found was an overwhelming preference for peer-led tailored behavioral interventions. Um, that includes things like peer-led counseling, outreach, education, and information exchange. These were considered to be uh, more effective and desirable than those led by non-peer counterparts. Uh, that said, participants did note that the efficacy of behavioral interventions can be greatly reduced um, by structural barriers and drivers of vulnerability. For example, participants from the NSWP network noted that behavioral interventions aimed at getting sex workers to use condoms more consistently can't be fully effective when those same condoms are then used to arrest sex workers, I guess, evidence to arrest sex workers. So it's really hard to fully judge the um, impacts of behavioral interventions without looking at the structural barriers as well. Next, please. Then we looked at values and preferences surrounding different modes of service delivery. What we found was a strong emphasis and preference placed on fostering trust, building personal connections and establishing rapport between patient and provider within health services. Again, we also found a strong preference for community led services, which were seen as being a very effective in helping counterbalance the stigma and discrimination that are so rampant in mainstream health services for key populations. Um, Community-led services were also seen as offering more targeted and sensitized care, as well as providing more accessible, confidential, and safe spaces. 
Um, as to the question of online services, they were generally viewed favorably by participants, though it was clear that online services can never replace in-person, uh, largely due to the preferences that I just mentioned, but also because there remain great um, inequities and disparities in terms of access to digital di ICTs, as well as digital literacy. Next, please. Then we looked at hepatitis C testing and treatment values and preferences. Uh, with the exception of participants from the input, input network, we noted that most participants had pretty limited knowledge of HCV testing and treatment. Um, uh, accordingly, awareness of and access to pangenotypic DAA treatment varied greatly across populations, but the participants who felt they were able to answer the question about um, that type of hepatitis treatment were generally quite in favor of it. But overall, we noted that there were significant barriers to hepatitis treatment for key populations, including cost, abstinence requirements, uh, delays, stigma and discrimination, as well as lack of political will and information. Next, please. Then we looked at values and preferences surrounding STI prevention, testing, and treatment. And this was centered around a question on the pooled sampling method for uh, screening for gonorrhea and chlamydia, and that question was uh, asked in the research of IMPACT and NSWP, and what we found was that um, our participants had generally very little knowledge surrounding that particular uh, screening method, therefore there needs to be uh, more education and awareness uh, raising surrounding that method for key populations. Generally speaking, participants just emphasize the importance of improving access to rights-based STI prevention services, like having regular STI checkups, as opposed to things like periodic presumptive treatment, which were viewed overwhelmingly negatively and which are not recommended anyway. <laughs> um, and again, we just noted there was a preference for community-led services due to the stigma and discrimination, criminalization, violence, and marginalization, which um, impacts their experiences in mainstream health settings. Next, please. Then we looked at HIV prevention, and I suppose it's not a surprise, but there is no one-size-fits-all approach to HIV prevention for key populations. The values and preferences vary so greatly, um, both within population group and across individuals. Therefore, we really need to have um, tailored approaches as well as a variety of different options available to key populations. That said, many participants did note that external condoms and lubricant, as well as OAT, NSP, and other harm reduction supplies are pillars of HIV prevention for their communities. And that's not to say that other HIV prevention methods are not essential as well. They just weren't emphasized as often or there were greater barriers noted to accessing them. Uh, for example, PEP and PrEP were acknowledged as being very effective methods, but they remain largely inaccessible across communities. Participants also noted that there is generally insufficient information and even a lot of misinformation surrounding PrEP within their communities. Uh, therefore, greater care really needs to be taken when promoting PrEP to key population groups to ensure that it's accompanied by sufficient and accurate information. And then lastly, again, there was a preference uh, for HIV prevention to be uh, or services and, and, and dosing regimens um, to be facilitated within community-led settings. So mobile clinics, uh, harm reduction settings, peer outreach, and drop-in centers were preferred. Next, please. And now uh, let's look at some of the structural barriers to HIV, STI, and hepatitis services. These are also not new at all, but they bear repeating because they continue to powerfully shape key populations, values, and preferences, as well as access to services. So stigma and discrimination lead to poor treatment by providers or even denial of treatment. Um, they foster breaches of confidentiality, as well as violence and abuse within healthcare settings. Stigma and discrimination can also lead to internalized stigma amongst key population members, which then discourages them from seeking out treatment or adhering to treatment. Um, next, the criminalization of sex work, drug use, same-sex relations, and gender identity uh, lead to fears and very real risks of legal repercussions when people are accessing health services. They perpetuate punitive policies and practices like the use of condoms or injecting supplies as evidence. 
And lastly, they also contribute to the exclusion of key population-led organizations from funding as well as state health responses. And lastly, uh, lack of legal gender recognition is a major structural barrier for trans and gender diverse people. It's very closely connected to the lack of gender affirming care in general, as well as barriers to education, employment, and housing, which exacerbate vulnerability. Next, please. And then lastly, we looked at enabling interventions. Uh, these are not new either. Um, <laughs> policy reform, anti-violence measures, community empowerment, and funding have all been recommended um, previously within the key population specific guidelines that were previously developed um, in collaboration between the key population networks and different UN agencies. On the left-hand side, you can see some thumbnails. Um, policy reform, community empowerment, and anti-violence were also critical enablers within the last WHO guidelines. Um, so we're not reinventing the wheel here, but we're just reaffirming the importance of these measures um, in, in promoting rights-based services and dismantling structural barriers. Next, please. So in sum, uh, key populations played a leading role in developing and implementing this research. Uh, we presented our findings last year at the guidelines development group meeting so that they could help inform the development of the guidelines. Uh, some of the networks have also produced population specific reports. And let's see, in the coming months, NSWP is also going to, to be producing a smart sex workers guide to the updated guidelines. Um, and the other networks as well will be disseminating resources within their communities to help raise awareness of the updated guidelines as well. And yeah, on behalf of the key population networks, we hope to continue our partnership with WHO that we've developed to ensure that key populations are meaningfully involved um, from the global to the national level, both in dissemination and in training and health systems. Thank you. That's it. Thank you so much, Anna, for an excellent presentation covering research on community preferences, addressing structural barriers, enabling interventions, community-led services and, and empowerment, and how communities are actually thinking and already working on um, taking these guidelines forward. And the next step in our session will actually be a quick reflection on audience perspectives. So you have two links now in the chat that you can click on, and then there will be two questions specifically on your country's um, 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 needs in terms of technical assistance to implement the revised WHO guidelines. That's the first question. So question A is on your country's TA technical assistance needs. Um, you can indicate the need um, in, in, in that box and then also and indicate your country afterwards, if you like, so we can see whether there's some regional diversity of patterns in your responses in terms of technical assistance needs. Um, the second question then will be on um, changes needed to be done to incorporate the revisions of the WHO guidelines, the new guidelines um, into your national um, guidelines and, and uh, actual responses. So those are the two questions. In the interest of time, I suggest that we just take a moment to see whether this is working so that you can click on it, make your responses. And while you do that, we'll already move on with the agenda um, and um, um, start with our panel discussion. So we have actually sufficient time for our panelists to respond to those questions. So um, colleagues, feel free to click now on those two links and respond to the two questions. Technical assistance needs first, and then secondly, um, what changes are actually needed in your national context in response to the new guidelines. Um, with that, we can actually move on to our panel discussion. And um, Annette Fester from WHO will actually um, um, ask questions to um, a number of panelists from country level, from global funding partners um, and other technical partners, community, global community networks um, and UN agencies. So you have the names of the 
panelists here. I think we'll introduce them as we ask the questions to them. Um, Annette, over to you for, for the panel questions um, to, to the different colleagues. Can you, hear me? can you hear me and see me? Yes, we can yes. hear you. Good. Thanks very much, Clemens. And thank you all, also the former speakers, for uh, two excellent presentations summarizing what we have been trying to do over the last few years in WHO. As you can see, it's been quite a mammoth uh, exercise to bring together all existing relevant recommendations with regard to three disease areas. And actually we also included TB, so there were more than three disease areas. And um, from prevention to diagnosis to treatment for five um, key populations. So we're very proud to be able to share these guidelines with you. But of course, the most important part starts now and that's with the dissemination, dissemination of um, and implementation of the, the recommendations. And we, um, this, this event is one of those uh, dissemination events. So we're very grateful for the Global HIV Prevention Coalition and the South to South Learning Network for this uh, opportunity. And um, uh, we have an excellent panel here with um, starting with um, uh, Dr. Aleni Kuto from the Ministry of Health from Mozambique. Um, and um, we, we know that uh, Mozambique has almost finalized the national key population strategy. Um, and we would like to ask you if there have been any challenges and what, what is next in Mozambique for the implementation of our guidelines. Um, so perhaps you can, um, you can quickly respond to these. We have a few minutes to, for your response, uh, Dr. Aleni Kuto. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon to everyone. Yeah, challenges, I think, uh, is something that we're still struggling when we talk about key population. And uh, yes, we are going to finalize our key population guidelines. We had a, a stop when we started last year because we knew that new guidelines were come up. And we know that um, sex workers, same-sex relationships, relationships in Mozambique is not there criminalized, but uh, we still have challenges in terms of rollout of interventions to mitigate new infections among key population. And one of those barriers that we, we see and is very important, it starts with the culture and religious convictions that we have among service providers. Therefore, there's no acceptance that key populations do exist. And when we don't accept as a provider that key population exists, we won't do the screening to really uh, understand if this person is or, uh, someone from this group for key population or not, and offer proper service that is recommended for key population. But also, there's, uh, as I said, stigma discrimination is not just within health facilities. We still have stigma discrimination at our communities, uh, 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 despite of all some of acceptance, but most of the population still not comprehend what are key population, what they're important. So there's a lack of perception of importance of mitigation of HIV among key population because they are, most of them are the driver of the, of the, of the, of the high prevalences. In our countries, general prevalence is very high, but when we account with the key population, still higher uh, comparing to the general prevalence. So uh, I think that there's a lack of knowledge also of, of their own rights when come and responsibilities when it comes from key population communities, like right, right to access of health, legal service, responsible for following the rules and the laws. And also we know that when it comes to discuss key population, lack of funding to implement all recommended service for key population. We are still seeing that when it comes to prioritize in terms of service, we, we are prioritize care and treatment is, is more important put people on treatment, but it's not important to have prevention and screening and try to find out more key population in order to prevent new, new, new infections. So uh, this process of developing the key population guidelines in our country, uh, I think was a process that we knew that we have to align as much as possible with, uh, with, the, with the WHO. So I think the, the new guidelines will help us to sustain our decisions and programs based on the evidence that is showing that and based on what we had been already doing. I think it's important that guidelines come in a good time. Over. 
Thank you so much, um, Dr. Aleni Kuto. It's really encouraging to hear um, uh, some examples of countries uh, on how your response will be following uh, the launch of our guidelines and to address some of the issues that have also come up in the questions uh, today as we, as we were uh, listening to the various presentations on how to make sure that countries follow uh, the recommendations that we make. And of course, this is a very difficult, this is the critical uh, issue that, um, that we are all struggling uh, with, but we hope that these guidelines really pave the way and will help all partners to advocate for focusing our responses when we're talking about HIV and, and STIs and hepatitis to, mm -hmm. to focus on these populations. So Mozambique, you, thank you very much. Uh, for this uh, excellent uh, example of of how you have you are trying to do this um, in your country, <clears throat> um, the next question is for um, our representative from PEPFAR, who is not Tisha Wheeler, as is um, mentioned here, but Kent Clindera. And Kent, um, we just of course acknowledge that uh, PEPFAR is a critical partner. Uh, in the global response, especially with regard to HIV for T populations. Having uh, heard a little bit about these guidelines, and, and I know you've also seen them uh, before, um, what do you think are the most important uh, aspects of our guidelines and, and how can they help PEPFAR with further um, um, advocating and implementation of um, appropriate programs for and um, services for key populations. Sure, thanks Annette, and I'm happy to be with everyone today. Um, you know, first just wanna thank the Global Prevention Coalition and the South to South Network for this webinar. You know, guidance like this is extremely helpful. And so the more it can be disseminated, um, you know, all more the better, especially as a development partner um, working alongside country governments and communities, you know, including KPOPs themselves, they, they really help um, help us in our, 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 our struggle around HIV epidemic control. Um, I think a few things from PEPFAR standpoint in reaction to the guidance, um, you know, first of all, I think it's important to note that we have a new ambassador in Dr. Enko Song, um, and he's been very strong in the beginning here um, on his language around health equity um, for priority in key populations. It's one of the first of five strategic pillars. So guidelines like this are extremely helpful right now uh, because we've got this, this new framework for PEPFAR. Um, I think secondly, in reference to viral hepatitis and other STIs, you know, PEPFAR has um, always followed WHO guidance. Um, however, being such a HIV focused program, um, it's been a challenge often for, for some of our programs to integrate STI treatment and control um, for all KPs. Um, so I think the emphasis here, you know, really helps us, um, if you will, help our country teams feel more empowered to include and fund STI viral hepatitis screening treatment um, in, in their programs. So I think that's very helpful. Um, thirdly, um, you know, the whole focus and the emphasis on young KPs, clearly our data shows they're underserved. So explicitly naming young PEs with specific recommendations and guidance, I think is helpful. Um, really integrating some of that into national policies, um, national strategies and comprehensive programming. Um, you know, the, the guidance does a really good job of highlighting that gap um, and offering some really strong recommendations. Um, and in fact, we're in dialogue with our youth colleagues who work more generally with young people to recognize how KPs are sort of driving that epidemic amongst young people. Um, and of course, continuing to listen and engage young people themselves in service delivery and design. Um, fourthly, I'll just say, I think the emphasis on peer navigation, many of us who have been working in this area for a long time, recognize the importance of that. I think just highlighting that component, um, you know, too often that effort is not remunerated. So I think this emphasis will help us integrate these folks clearly into national um, clinical service delivery systems and also make sure they're getting paid for those efforts because I think that's often taken for granted. Um, I think Fifthly, let me just say, you know, PEPFAR along with Global Fund, we've been supporting community-led monitoring systems um, with some specific guidance about being KP inclusive. Um, 
And so while there's still room for improvement, I was just at a global meeting where there are a lot of struggles. Um, I think, you know, guidance like this really helps our community-led monitoring, um, implementing partners have a, a stronger voice and have a stronger recommendations to use. So these guidelines are, are really going to be helpful, I think, for that process. Um, I think, you know, just kind of in conclusion, um, you know, Dr. Ngozom's leadership at PEPFAR is really also building a, a sustainability framework. We're looking at success in some countries where we're, we're technically in our 95-95 goals, very close to epidemic control. So what does that look like for the future of what a PEPFAR is? Um, and so I think, you know, a framework uh, that Dr. Ankerson has put out around health equity, as I mentioned in the beginning, really that's about strengthening the support of KP-led community services, um, community-led monitoring, and, and really this whole focus, which I think you've done so well on in terms of tackling laws, policies, and other structural barriers that continue to fuel these inequalities. Um, so in general, you know, the guidance is super helpful right now. I um, appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks very much, Kent. Uh, and thanks for making these uh, great points. It's really good um, to hear about the need for integration um, because of course of efficiency and effectiveness of programs and move a little bit away from uh, the silo uh, programming that we have been doing with HIV for quite a while. I also want to mention the, the fact that WHO has been able to develop these guidelines thanks to the a generous contribution of PEPFAR and um, uh, the Gates Foundation. So I uh, just wanted to mention that. Also, thank you for mentioning uh, young key population because several questions were put in the, in the Q&A with regard to young uh, key populations and just to make sure that um, uh, I mean I, I hope you will all read the guidelines but um, it, just a chapter on young key, key populations also uh, strengthens the need to or, or, or stresses the need for access to all the, rec the recommendations we're making for key populations irrespective of what the laws say uh, in countries or what the what age uh, key populations have at that time. Thank you again. Uh, we're moving to um, Susie McLean from Global Fund. Susie, are you there? I'm here. Oh, very good. Hi. See, can see and hear you. Thanks for, for joining, Susie. Um, of course, Global Fund is also a critical partner, important partner in fin funding um, uh, programs uh, for HIV and now uh, also with more focus on integration of other disease areas, uh, in particular in low and middle income countries. And um, we were wondering if you could say something about how our guidelines um, help you to advocate with countries to prioritize key populations in their grant proposals. And perhaps if you can also look towards future transitioning countries, uh, if there's any uh, role for the gold for the guidelines and the recommendations um, to continue these prioritized packages uh, in these countries. Thanks. Sure. Um, and hello, colleagues. Uh, so yeah, my name is Susie McLean, and I'm the HIV Prevention Advisor at the Global Fund. Um, and let me just say how much we welcome the key population guidelines and how important they are. Um, and in fact, I would say fundamental to our, um, to our funding approach. We fund according to um, the guidelines. And so without the guidelines, you know, it, it, you know it's a critical dependency. Um, and that's not just because of the relationship with our agencies, it's because the work the Global Fund, that WHO does to mobilise and identify the evidence base. And um, so the Global Fund's committed to you know, the best interventions that are most proven for the most people um, who need them most. So we really um, are grateful to and welcome WHO's work to crystallise uh, all of that evidence. And to also emphasize things like the critical enablers to make the evidence-based interventions work most for the people who need them most. Um, we know some of the uh, some of the, um, the big signals or the changes and stuff, 
um, that Anton referred to at the outset. And um, we've adjusted our funding um, systems and guidelines accordingly. Um, from the outset, it's important, and that you just referred to it briefly, but I want to emphasize that the Global Fund's funding guidance for HIV is um, kind of is informed and, and kind of led by WHO's wider than HIV approach that addresses sexual health and hepatitis. We've tried as much as we can within with the constraints that we have. The Global Fund is, you know, as you know, a funder for HIV, TB, malaria, but we're trying yeah. to approach our funding guidelines to respond to this direction of travel that the WHO is signaling so that we, our investments have a wider than HIV impact, in particular in terms of sexual health and hepatitis. So that's something we've really tried to do with our guidance for the next cycle, for example. So once again, we're very grateful to Dorocho to helping us seek to have um, impact on sexual health and hepatitis as we seek to have effect on HIV. Um, the, 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 on the, the big changes that are signalled with these guidelines, I wanted to make um, mention to a couple of them because they matter hugely to the way we develop our funding guidance. For example, the behaviour change one, we've already talked about it. Global Fund's a big funder in behaviour change communication. So as we were getting these signals from WHO about some of the evidence issues and some of the kind of policy issues related to that, we've tried to shift our modules for funding accordingly. So for example, we're not kind of doing away with the behavior change communication category as such. A lot of really important key population programming is being funded under that category. But what we've tried to do is to shift the kind of naming and the purpose of it to be much more about demand creation and prevention communication for improved uptake of prevention options for in populations and adolescent girls and young women. So, yeah, so it's it's changed it's changed our the way we understand our investment priorities, and we've tried to find this balance between retaining some of the important work that's funded under that, but also try to sharpen up the purpose and focus for that work. So it's much more about demand creation, so that people, for example, sex workers, have better information and access to key prevention options, such as PrEP or condoms. Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention, it's kind of one of our biggest and strongest strategy commitments in this space that applies very much for key populations and for which the guidelines are very helpful, um, is around our Global Fund strategy commitment to close the coverage gap for HIV prevention for populations and for adolescent girls and young women and men in high incidence locations um, that will you know we none of us know what the outcomes of the replenish global fund replenishment will be but I think we can assume that we won't have the full um, the full resource for all prevention for all people so as always with um, uh, with this type of work resource constraints are implied and prioritization is important. So we feel like it's a very important, the guidelines are a very important tool to help countries to make these critical decisions about prioritization. <laughs> but in that, in that critical decision making about prioritization, the key pop the incre increasing access to coverage for key population programs is a really distinct global fund priority. So whilst we I feel like we often pay a lot of attention to what I refer to as the left-hand column, the inputs in the results chain, you know, how many elements from the comprehensive package are there in a, in a country's um, uh, program. One of the things that we wanted to also pay attention to is what are the prevention outcomes that arise from that and for how many people. So can a country with global fund resources or PEPFA resources or domestic resources increase coverage for sex worker programs, for example, from 30% to 80%. So, you know, what needs to change to really make sure that many, many more people get access to prevention. Um, just finally, um, Annette, on your uh, second questions about um, the guidelines and key population programs in transition, 
just to say that, um, you know, there are many other actors who could kind of answer that question better, but certainly from the Global Fund's perspective, when I think about the transition-related work in some of those countries that are transitioning towards greater in domestic investment, that key population programming is one of the things that's emphasised in the transition journey. So we're do, I feel like we're doing what we can to ensure that maintaining key population prevention, for example, but, but emphasising the coverage issues so that many more people have access to prevention um, is it always a prominent consideration in these transition plans that we make with countries. I think many more people on the call or more widely can add more about what it takes country by country, but certainly from a transition planning perspective, key population prevention is always prioritised. So thanks to Rachel for this great work. It's really important for the way we invest in key population programs. Thanks so much, Susie. Um, really uh, good points. And um, we really hope that uh, these guidelines really, you know, help countries at the end uh, prioritize key populations uh, in order to have an impact on not only HIV, but also hepatitis and STIs uh, epidemics. So um, just moving a little bit away from HIV and to make justice also to the fact that these guidelines really are about the three disease areas. Um, I'd like to invite um, Tajinder Tivana from the World Health of World Hepatitis Alliance. Um, are you here, Tajinder? Hi, yes, I'm here. Oh, very good. Hi, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Um, yeah, so um, we, we're really uh, excited to, to have you on the panel um, as well and to hear your views of how our guidelines um, whether you see there are opportunity opportunities for hepatitis programming from this integrated approach that we have adopted in the in the guidelines and or do you also see potential risk uh, because of the fact that there is of course always stigma and discrimination related to key populations which perhaps is not so uh, pronounced in in the hepatitis um, world uh, yet but should be given that they're of course also are at increased risk. So that's our question for you. Yeah, great. Um, well, firstly, thank you um, to the organizers for having us. I'm really happy to be here and, and um, give hepatitis voice as well. Um, and, and to say thanks for WHO as well for the new set of guidance um, that addresses viral hepatitis for key populations. Um, I think as it's been said, you know, it's important that these these kind of disease areas are brought together um, the public responses um, and the risks do overlap. So for one of the main key things for hepatitis is, um, especially one of the key opportunities is to remember that um, the approach is going to essentially improve the lives of people living with hepatitis. Um, it will have significant impacts on the quality of life for key populations. Um, and, you know, obviously they're across different places in the world. So whether it's through prevention or treatment or care, um, which is obviously so important as a human right. Um, it's the key services that make, it needs to be make, made sure that the key services put the individuals in key populations and the communities at the center. So leading with a patient centered approach is so important. Um, I think the guidelines also really help to ensure that, you know, every contact of every individual in key populations is, is really taken into account. Um, and the guidelines are a fundamental step for this as well, uh, given it's a key population community led response. Um, kind of having hepatitis as part of the integrated approach is so important. Um, there's, you know, still lacking a lot of awareness and information and people don't realize the importance such as, you know, every 30 seconds, someone's loses their life to hepatitis related illness. Um, so another opportunity that comes out of this integrated approach is the solidarity across the organizations and donors and governments coming together for key populations. Um, 
a smaller kind of hepatitis led NGOs and civil society organizations can be around one to two people. They might be small grassroots organizations as well, working in their community or amongst key populations. So supporting that and giving a bit more of a robust infrastructure and cooperation um, and support through development and learning is, is really, really valuable and so important. Um, another key opportunity is giving people with hepatitis, people living with hepatitis a voice. Um, it can be incredibly isolating um, amongst key groups and communities. Um, it can be really hard to access services um, and hard to have a voice to demand for better services. So in this integrated approach, um, you know, working together in the shared space across the landscape is so important um, and, and representing the key populations as well. Um, I think there are other opportunities for financing too. Um, and, you know, we know that viral hepatitis claims 1.4 million lives each year. That's more than HIV and malaria combines, but HIV just receives just a fraction of the support compared to other organisations. Um, so, so elements like that and the integrated approach and um, other strategies are so important as well. Um, we're seeing change uh, and we're really um, happy and welcome the new concept note from Global Fund which will support hepatitis communities greatly, as well as other strategies as well. Um, I think now it's about embracing the guidelines, ensuring there's a shift for hepatitis, encouraging more donors and countries and governments to address the global burden um, and uh, making sure that organizations use their voices and platforms um, to commit to all of the disease areas amongst the guidelines. Um, I guess for the possible risks for stigma, um, you know, stigma and discrimination is still so widespread for viral hepatitis. Um, I think from a study, 93% of civil society representatives across 72 countries reported um, that there was some level of stigma and discrimination. So that's across 72 countries. Um, and it's such a barrier to testing and care. Um, and as a result, you know, only one in 10 people um, with hepatitis know that they have it and even fewer receive treatment. Um, I think we've seen that stigma is often rooted in um, the fear of infection and transmission. There's so much misinformation and misconception about transmission as well. Um, and there's stigma about what it's like to live with hepatitis and societal judgment too. Um, and then that might result in some internalized stigma, stigma and impacts on mental health as well, um, which in turn just leads to inequalities and um, lower quality of life and more suffering and a slowed res response amongst countries as well um, due to that stigma element. Um, you know, hepatitis has been neglected for, for a long time. So um, key populations and communities are often invisible um, and the detrimental, the, the impacts worldwide are really detrimental. So um, guidelines like this and other policy changes are so important. Um, and yeah, I guess... You know, another element of the stigma is the discriminatory policies um, that people live, living with hepatitis often face. Um, and, you know, sometimes they can be disguised as public health interventions, but they might not have a benefit for people living with hepatitis or their families or their human rights as well. So, you know, integrated approaches such as this, changes in policy, anti-discrimination laws, more education, health systems working together with civil society organisations, all of it can ensure that key populations receive the support and care they need. Um, and it's about, you know, pushing forward with that patient centered and, and, and community focused um, approach and care through the integrated approach with the, with the other um, disease areas as well. Thanks uh, so much. Um, <clears throat> that's uh, for, for your excellent points. It was really good to hear um, um, your perspective and and the efficiencies and 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 the overlaps and um, that it makes sense to um, to work on uh, a response that is integrated and patient centered. Thank you so much, Tajinder. Um, next, I would like to move to Andrew Spieldener. Are you here, Andrew? From Impact. Yes, I'm here. I hear you. I don't see you yet, but um, Andrew, um, 
of course, we've been uh, working very closely on the development of these uh, of these guidelines. And as we've uh, mentioned earlier, now it is critical to focus on its implementation. So um, my question for you is, um, how is impact planning to use these guidelines in, in your network? And um, how can you work with uh, with partners together also in countries to operationalize these guidelines? Thank you, Annette. Um, you know, we're at a moment where countries, uh, some countries are arguing over the existence of key populations still. And these guidelines come in an incredibly important moment to affirm and assert that key populations exist, that we do carry a disproportionate burden of these diseases, and that there are interventions and ways to move forward. Um, I, we at Impact, uh, you know, some of us are very new to working with WHO on these guidelines, and we appreciate being included. Um, one of the things that was important for our constituents to see is the acknowledgement of the other factors, the structural factors that um, bar our ability to get interventions, to get treatment, diagnosis. Um, and to actually seek out health health services. Excuse, excuse me, Andrew. Um, I'm I'm just getting a message that if you could speak up a little bit because the interpreters have difficulty in hearing you um, for the translation, and you are quite low. You the volume. I don't know. If there's a way. Of... Let me see about change. You're muted now. Is this better? Say that again. Is this better? Yes, I think so, a little bit. Apologies for that. That's good, uh, yeah. Okay. So we, uh, at our constituents were, uh, you know, we're very happy to see the other structural barriers included in the WHO guidelines that bar us from seeking uh, healthcare services, including diagnosis and treatment, um, the, including stigma and discrimination, criminalization, and the lack of legal gender recognition. Um, we were happy that our research was incorporated, in particular, to add nuance and context to things like chemsex, which um, was a, uh, uh, an exciting conversation to be part of. And I think the guidelines um, look at the current events of research or the current standards of research and um, and really drive a way forward for how do we address these issues. I think most importantly is that many of the guidelines address what doesn't work. Um, and I think that's as important as identifying what does work. And so in some cases, when we saw um, that certain behavioral interventions were not effective, um, it was, uh, you know, I think that that's an important part of uh, moving forward with communities. I think our our constituents are very clear that these guidelines will save lives, in particularly the hepatitis C treatment recommendations. In our communities, we know that hepatitis C treatment um, is uh, often um, difficult to come by, and that most of the lack of treatment is because of drop off between. Um, diagnosis and verification, and that uh, it was incredibly important to see that the hepatitis C treatment um, be uh, be recommended um, upon diagnosis, um, so that people aren't lost to care. I think what's vital is also the incorporation of what happened during COVID in these guidelines. We can't um, unring the bell of COVID and we can't pretend that things go back to normal. There has been increased violence. There has been a lack of access to services and there has been an uptick in online interventions. And we all see that the guidelines embrace these changes in the public health infrastructure and in our communities. I think for us moving forward, um, Anna com commented that um, the global key population networks will be um, presenting different kinds of tools for our constituents to be able to argue or assert our rights um, for diagnosis, treatment, and care in these contexts, especially considering um, what we face in terms of stigma, discrimination, criminalization, um, and the lack of legal gender recognition. Thank you.
Thanks so much, Andrew. And thanks for saying that these guidelines save lives. That's um, that's a beautiful way of putting it. <laughs> um, the next, uh, I just wanted to say that we, in this panel this afternoon, uh, we have a representative from Impact, from the Men of Sex with Men community and from the sex worker community. And this morning we did a similar um, uh, webinar for people at the other end of the world. And we had uh, representatives from the drug user network input and from um, um, GATE, from the uh, trans and gender diverse um, people network. So our next speaker is from uh, this net, net, network of set worker project, Felister Abdallah. Can, are you here, Felister? Yes, I'm here. Very good. Thank you very much for joining. Um, and we can see you now too. Um, Thanks uh, for joining again. And um, as, as I mentioned also to Andrew, we've worked on this very closely with uh, key population networks to develop these guidelines. And um, NSWP is already um, in the process of developing sex worker guides and um, have, has also plans to share the guidelines with the community. Perhaps you can say a little bit more about why that was uh, what was done and, and a little bit more about these next steps in the dissemination and implementation. Thank you very much. And thank you for this opportunity. Um, me being here and speaking as the president of NSWP, I want to say that it has been our culture uh, to see the importance of community involvement because um, uh, consultations for the community has become very important for our communities. One, because we end up understanding the reason why on the table and we can be able to contribute on the table simply because we understand the tools. It has been a culture for NSWP to make sure that we come up with smart guides. <laughs> Um, apart from that, a lot of consultations come from the community because we want to speak the simpler language that we will associate with as a community. So there's a lot of consultation through the membership. There's a lot of um, holding meetings and making sure that we are on the same page as a community. Um, this is what we've been able to do as NSWP. But also another thing why we always want to do consultations is by making sure that how many uh, languages do community identify themselves with? Because it's not all the community members can be able to speak English. But in our consultations, we also become language sensitive by making sure that people who are not English speakers are part and parcel of those consultations. Um, there's this thing that we call community languages. We understand that uh, when WHO or any other uh, partners are coming up with documents, uh, and they end up having these uh, difficult languages or, or technical languages. But our consultations is breaking down that to our community language, to a language that we can relate with, but still meaning the same thing that was put in the table. I want to give an example of the sex workers implementation tool, uh, the suite. Uh, I think when it was first made, it was very difficult. Uh, when, when, when the bigger document was made by WHO, it was very difficult for us. But when we had a smart guide to the suite, it made it simple for me, even as a community person, to be able to know this is taking me to this page. This is what community empowerment means. When they talk about condom programming and lubricants, this is what means in my language. And this is a document that we've been able to help us even make uh, community-led programming in our countries and in our organizations to become very simpler. Yes, we are in the process of making the documents. Um, they are still in the process as you've had being made. It is our initiative to come out and, and, and launch them, but um, not anytime soon. Let's give it a time frame of December. But one of the things is the mm -hmm. fact that um, we are happy because this will make us uh, not to feel stigmatized or discriminated when people are having conversations or discussions on the table. Um, this is like a support unit for communities of sex workers because if I go to negotiate for my space at any level, then it means I have a clear understanding of what the guidelines are saying. I was in a community meeting in Kenya because I'm a Kenyan sex worker and um, conversations were really happening. I think that time I was just coming in as an activist and I had passion from my heart because I was representing my community. But the language that the people were using and when people were talking about WHO was like, 
what's that? What are they talking about? I was trying to bring it down, trickle it down to my community and I was making a lot of noise because I did not understand. Then I remember Ruth Morgan was in that meeting that time and she said, why were you making noise? I know you have passion, but you need to communicate. From that time, I understood the importance of communication as a community, understanding my need as a community, but also putting my need into the understanding of the available resources that we have, resources, for example, like these ones that have been made by WHO, for me to be able to push my agenda into the government meetings, for us to be able to sensitize the healthcare providers, for us to be able to run the rights-based uh, programming in our countries. It is for us to have that best better understanding of what, of what the documents are made of. What are the documents saying? How can we articulate it in our own understanding? And how can we make sure that we are walking this journey together as sex workers and making sure that nobody is left behind due to because of not understanding, because of language barrier, or so many things. And this is how we've been able to stand up as a community and make sure that our SMITE guides are guides that have been led by the community, spoken by the community, and made by the community from their own understanding to their own implementation. Thank you. And we say sex workers do it better. Fantastic, uh, Felister. Thank you so much for this uh, passionate um, uh, response and um, of all, and summarizing the further uh, activities with regard to the guidelines for the sex worker community. Um, our final uh, panelist is uh, Ehab Sala from the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime. And um, Ehab, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Hi, Anna. Hi, hi. Good to see you. Good to see you um, of course, um, we have worked very closely together with four of the five uh, key population networks and the prison population uh, is often neglected or forgotten, not uh, and in part, it is because they, they don't have a representative uh, network, uh, global network, as um, the, the other populations. So uh, you are responsible for the work on HIV and prisons in UNODC. And um, I would like to hear from you um, how you see um, these guidelines help the overall response to HIV as well as viral hepatitis. Maybe a little bit uh, less, your focus will be on STIs, but um, uh, if you can include them as well, that would be great. Uh, for people in prisons and, and what do you think is needed most to address them? Yeah, um, thank you very much, Anat, and good morning, good afternoon, colleagues. And thanks to South to South Learning Network and Global Prevention Coalition for having me and this uh, important event and webinar, and of course, thanks to um, WHO colleagues. Yes, and actually, you're right, because of the, despite of the significant progress that has been made in the HIV response at the global level, uh, prison populations have been systematically left behind and continue to face severe inequalities that limit their access to HIV and other health-related health services. According to the political declaration, people in prison are five times more likely to be living with HIV than adults in the general population. Same data, similar data are also available for the higher prevalence of hepatitis, B and C, STIs, and tuberculosis as well. We work with partners to promote certain um, interventions and we believe that the new guidelines will help to promote the intervention, the evidence-based and gender-responsive interventions to address HIV, TB, STIs, and hepatitis among people in prison. And this is very, very much needed. Most importantly is to address the barriers when it comes to the prison population. Yes, prison is part of the community. However, there's still some barriers and that's limiting access of people in prison um, to evidence-based intervention. Now, I believe that we work together with WHO and communities and civil society to address these barriers and ensure access to these interventions to people in prison. And most importantly, the political will. And this is another one more important thing that limit the access of 
uh, people in prison through evidence-based intervention because many countries all over the world, there is lack of political will and considering prison is a security place and also non-compliance with the international standards for health in the community and, and pe people in prison as well. Another barrier, which is also important, is lack of coordination. And you can see that we should learn from our own experiences. COVID-19 has exposed the situation of prison health. And you will see that prison is not integrated within the community health. And there's separation between prison health and public health. And this is why we need to work together to ensure that there's a coordination mechanism, steering committee, working group, we name it, to work in prison health. And this includes prison doctors, prison health care providers, community health care providers, civil societies, and communities, and also donors as well, UN and the international communities working on this. This is one of the things that's much needed for the time being. Lack of resources is also another thing, which is also big in many countries all over the world. Even big donors, they might not be putting enough or sufficient funding to address present health as well because of many reasons. This is why we need to work together, everybody here, to ensure that there is enough resources. Here I'm talking about financial and human resources as well. We need to work together to ensure that there is enough resources to address um, all these uh, topics related to prison health as well. Lack of monitoring and evaluation programs and lack of, lack of data. This is also another issue um, that because many prison health systems, they are running without a sound and many system. They don't collect enough data and the, definitely it doesn't help to address or to help the strategy development as well. Since we talk about um, communities and civil society organizations, civil society organizations are not uh, well represented and it's not providing and contributing to addressing prison health in many countries, maybe because of lack of resources or the security nature of prisons and all of that. So you don't find a lot of contribution from civil society um, in prison settings as well. This is also very, very uh, important. I don't want to talk too much. I can continue talking like this forever. However, I want to say that we need to work together to ensure that there's a coordination mechanism. We need to raise the awareness to uh, share all these comprehensive guidance documents, international standards, and train people in prison, health and non-health people, on how to use all of these things we also need to develop standard operating procedures because we believe that the comprehensive package we are talking about, the guidelines, we need to translate this into actions through standard operating procedures to be adapted to the present context. This is very important. And we need to also work to mobilize national and international resources and develop a sound MLE system. We are committed to work with you all in order to make sure that people in prison, they have access to evidence-based um, interventions. Finally, and as Annette said, I'm sorry that Yona DC is talking on behalf of people in prison. We are working currently working with uh, partners to have the informal group of civil society organizations working on health and prison settings. We are, have the group already, and we are now issuing a contract to the secretariat of this group Hopefully, in future similar events, we will have this um, uh, representative of the group joining the discussion here. And finally, again, I would say that we are committed to work with all of you to ensure that the guidelines are implemented for people in prison. I would like to leave it here. Thank you very much. And back to you, Annette. Thank you so much, Ahab. Um, excellent uh, points, of course. Um, I won't summarize things because we're running out of time. I would just like to thank all of the panelists for a really rich um, conversation. And um, we're clearly not finished, but um, I give the floor back to the chair of the, uh, the moderator of this um, webinar, to Clemens. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Annette, and all the panelists. Great discussion. Let me just take one moment to remind you the way for you, all the participants and for the audience to provide feedback to us is through the SurveyMonkey link that Parabo has provided, two links with two questions, 
what are your country's technical assistance needs? First question. Second question, what needs to be done to incorporate those revisions into your national guidelines and programs? Please take a moment. This would really help us at the Prevention Coalition, help WHO in being responsive to your needs and taking this forward at country level. If we look at the data from our latest report, it showed that 70% of new HIV infections globally were among key populations and their sexual partners. And this means that these guidelines are not an aspect of guidance on HIV and the response. They are actually at the heart, at the center, the mainstay and focus of the global HIV re prevention response. And that's why um, this work is so, so important. So we encourage you to take it forward at country level, make critical investments now as we discuss um, global fund um, um, proposals, as Susie mentioned, new COP, the PEPA COP, um, and plans being made, um, domestic uh, financing um, plans being made for the next year. It's really critical that the key population response in line with these guidelines can actually be, be strengthened. And the new guidance provides an opportunity to raise the importance of key population programming again at country level. And at the level of this community of practice, we'll be looking at other aspects of the response in future sessions for which you will receive invitations that will include aspects of financing, monitoring, evaluation as other critical components. So um, we look forward to staying in touch and, um, and discussing again in future session on the sessions on those aspects. So thanks again to everybody who joined this session, uh, for all the um, presenters and panelists, and looking forward to future collaboration with all of you. Thanks so much. Have a great afternoon or evening um, or rest of the day, wherever you are. Thanks. <laughs>